Hi, Ho. Thank you uh, very much for joining for this week's uh, magnets. Um, as, um, as usual, our seminar format is about 25 minutes presentation, during which we can keep your microphone muted. Um, after that, we're going to have 10 to 15 minutes question discussion. You can use the chat or you can unmute yourself and ask the question. And at the end of this, uh, there is a part that is not recorded and it's a time for an informal catch up. So I'm really happy today to present uh, uh, the, to present here uh, Yoichi Usui for Kanazawa University of Japan, who is going to present uh, uh, um, the title three or five <laughs> components of magnetic mineralogy of a Cenozoic pelagic sediment in the North Pacific. Um, please feel free to share your screen. The floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, okay, uh, let me start. Uh, today, I will talk about environmental magnetism of pelagic sediments and try to convince you that the major variation uh, can be described by uh, three components. Uh, so, uh, sorry. Uh, first, I introduce uh, background motivation. Uh, during Cenozoic, uh, Global climate change show changes in various time scales. Uh, there is a, a general cooling trend and several short term warms and coolings. Then, the last few million years is characterized by large oscillations associated with uh, glacial cycles. Uh, the North Pacific has been affected also by uh, regional changes, especially in Central Asia. Particularly relevant to sediment magnetism is aeolian input from uh, Central Asia. The North Pacific has been uh, increase in dust flux has been observed at around 25 MA and probably around uh, 3.5 to 2 uh, MA. Each of them may correspond to uh, increased uh, aridity in Central Asia or uh, global cooling. In conventional environmental magnetism, signals are detected by single-valued proxies such as S-ratios. More recently, it has become common to consider uh, more than one, uh, more than two uh, uh, magnetic components in single samples. Uh, this has uh, enabled detailed discussions, but at the same time, a mixing into more than two components is often non-unique. One way to reduce the ambiguity is to compare our multiple sites to extract general pattern. And that is what I would like to present today. First, I introduce, uh, uh, sorry, uh, quickly, uh, uh, I show the sites I will mention today. Uh, these are in North uh, West Pacific. Today, I will not discuss much about their chronology simply, be, simply because uh, uncertainty is uh, so large. But basically, uh, the core bottoms are uh, thought to be early Paleogene or even Cretaceous. Um, but there may be hiatus or uh, considerable variations in sedimentation rates, so care should be taken to. Uh, convert depth variation uh, into uh, age progression. Uh, I will proceed uh, along this diagram, uh, first using simple analysis and then with more uh, complicated uh, techniques. I should stress that today I try to capture the first order features I believe detailed study of a site can recover more uh, components than I present today. First, uh, let's look at the division uh, between biogenic and terrigenous components. These days, it is near our common sense that sediments often contain uh, magnetofossils, and this also applies to a uh, pelagic red clay. These graphs show uh, um, ARM susceptibility over SIRM. 
this quantity uh, takes the highest value for non-interacting single domain grains. And for magnetite, the value can reach up to around three millimeter uh, per ampere. Magnetostatic interactions and larger grain size would reduce the value. All examined site, uh, part of the all examined site show a very high value up to 2.5 or 2.7. And uh, uh, this can only be explained by the dominance of non-interacting SD grains. At the same time, the range of the values indicate mixing of at least uh, two components. One is non-interacting SD and the other is not. The simplest interpretation is that non-interacting SD component reflects magnetoposis. <clears throat> now, an interesting question is whether there is a variation within the magnetic magnetoposis component. Because it is well known that different magnetic bacteria live in different environment, which can also be a paleo-environmental proxies. The above three graphs shows simple IRM acquisition gradients for magnetophosphate rich samples selected based on high ARM susceptibility. As you see, uh, even though these are from uh, different sites, they are uh, remarkably similar to each other. Moreover, if I decompose uh, some samples with uh, moderate ARM susceptibility value, like this one, and then I obtain a one magnet fossil component here labeled as C4, uh, which also shows similar coercivity and dispersion to uh, the above magnet fossil rich samples. Furthermore, these samples, including the one with moderate ARM susceptibility, contain a biogenic magnetite of very similar size and shape under uh, TEM observations. So I propose that pelagic red clay contain a single magnet fossil component uh, uh, coming from this equant uh, octahedral magnetite. As I emphasized, I propose this as a first order feature, and I will also discuss some exceptions later in this talk. We have seen uh, this uh, octahedral uh, biogenic magnetite. So now we move to the uh, subdivision of the pterygenous component. Again, uh, let me start from something simple. This is a, a cross plot of S ratio for 100 millitesla and uh, KARM over SIRM. Magnetosomes would uh, plot uh, somewhere here because these quantities are both normalized by SIRM. Mixing of two components uh, would produce a straight line on this plot. But I, I think these data uh, show more complex pattern, suggesting it is not simple uh, single biogenic and single uh, terrigenous component uh, mixing. I, su oh, sorry. Uh, I suggest uh, these data uh, uh, can be interpreted in this way. Uh, from one uh, low coercivity terrigenous component, uh, one line connects to uh, magnet uh, magnetophosis, and there is another line uh, extend to a lower S ratio, in other words, higher coercivity. But terrigenous components may have similar ARM susceptibility, and uh, they may, uh, multiple components may uh, plot on this line. So uh, from this data alone, uh, I cannot say, uh, uh, I can only say there are uh, more than two, uh, more than one terrigenous component in the North Pacific pelagic clades. At the same time, uh, this conclusion is uh, rather robust. So we require uh, more than one terrigenous component.
to get further information, I study one site, ODP uh, site 777, more closely. This site has rough age constraints from a uh, site report, as these ones. <clears throat> and this site also shows uh, high uh, ARM susceptibility at, uh, in the deeper part of the core and lower uh, ARM susceptibility in the upper part of the core. And this uh, interval uh, is expected to contain a less biogenic magnet, uh, component. And the age is uh, back to uh, around 12 MA. IRM acquisition curves uh, of uh, this interval uh, shows uh, is shown here. And uh, they show uh, uh, increasing coercivity it was the core top from around six meter depths. The structure of this variation is, is examined by a principal component analysis. The variance is explained by a three dimensional PC space, uh, PC1, PC2, and PC3. Uh, the colors show uh, depths of the samples. The data points in the PC space show a linear uh, trend uh, down to uh, around 6.25 meter, and then a cluster below these depths. And the trend towards the uh, cluster uh, expressed in this orange line uh, is probably uh, uh, shows increasing biogenic component to uh, the deeper part of the core. And, and another line here, blue line, uh, uh, suggests a mixing of two heterogeneous components uh, because biogenic component is somewhere here. Unlike ARM susceptibility, we expect distinct IRM acquisition curves for all different uh, heterogeneous components. So a linear trend here suggests that most of the variation can be explained by two heterogeneous components, although it wouldn't exclude additional components. The start of this trend is at 6.25 meters, which probably is around uh, two MA, give or take. Between 2 and 12 MA data here uh, show and the variation may be explained by simply increasing biogenic contribution without the need of additional heterogeneous components. I did similar analysis on another site northeast from uh, the site 777. This score uh, shows uh, low uh, ARM susceptibility throughout, suggesting smaller contribution of biogenic magnetite. And uh, uh, the age of the core is estimated by a uh, paleomagnetism and the bottom of the core is probably around two uh, million years ago. Uh, at first look, uh, the uh, IRM acquisition curves is explained, uh, is explained by uh, two trends in the principal component space. But in fact, uh, when I look at the depth variation of uh, principal components, PC2 shown in red here uh, shows uh, variation in rather restricted part of the core, which I think uh, uh, corresponds to a volcanic ash. So the majority of the data uh, is actually explained by a simple uh, to a simple linear trend to component mixing. And again, uh, the depth trend uh, suggests that uh, increasing uh, contribution of higher coercivity component uh, to the lower part and shallower part of the core. Uh, Paleomagnetism gives uh, these age uh, constraints. So uh, the data from this site also support that uh, from around 2 uh, MA, there is an increasing contribution of the higher coercivity heterogeneous component, 
against the lower uh, cohesive detergents component. Actually, this uh, uh, pattern is consistent with a classical work uh, by Yamazaki and Ioka, reporting increasing uh, cohesivity from around uh, two million years ago. Uh, at that time, uh, inferred from uh, uh, S ratios. Uh, back then, they interpreted the trend by mixing between one biogenic and one heterogeneous component. But present analysis suggests that the change within heterogeneous fraction may be uh, more important to explain this pattern. Um, so, uh, so far, uh, we have seen the basic three components the octahedral uh, magnetite are uh, everywhere. The higher uh, cohesivity intelligence component has become important from around 2 MA. And a lower uh, cohesivity component is present at least from 12 MA. An obvious limitation is that uh, I cannot constrain how far back in time the lower cohesivity component is present. I think the S ratio versus uh, ARM susceptibility plot uh, suggest that uh, there is a, only a one a common uh, low coercivity component, but the evidence is not so strong. Also, uh, when biogenic magnetite was dominant, probably before uh, 25 to uh, 35 MA, it is not easy to characterize terrigenous magnetic component, uh, even with detailed uh, mixing techniques. So uh, uh, it is unknown. Uh, uh, how far back this component is stably uh, present in North Pacific. Uh, but for now, uh, 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 let me move on to uh, some special components, um, bullet and uh, non-chain octahedra of biogenic magnetite. Um, Bullet-shaped magnet forces has been discovered from uh, this site uh, uh, like those ones shown here. <clears throat> I think uh, we can speculate the meaning of uh, uh, the bullet shaped magnetite in two ways. On the one hand, elongated uh, magnet forces have been thought to represent less oxic condition. And so uh, the presence of bullet shaped magnet forces in deep sea red clay may suggest that, uh, that these can be uh, used as an, a paleoenvironmental proxy. On the other hand, lithology, including the presence of manganese oxide, suggests that the sediments have been oxic throughout. So uh, the presence of uh, this kind of uh, magnet, magnet fossils may suggest that factors other than oxygen uh, might control the morphology of uh, magnet fossils. I have spent uh, some time to uh, uh, search for uh, similar uh, magnet forces in North Pacific red clay, but so far I found I haven't found uh, any uh, evidence. Uh, this pattern, this is another compilation of data, uh, this time uh, S ratio for 100 millitesla and S ratio for 30 millitesla, because uh, elongated uh, bullet shaped magnetite. Uh, mount fossils has higher coercivity than equivalent mount fossils. Uh, such grains uh, should plot uh, to a lower upper left of the plot. But the only core showing such trend shown in red here is actually the core uh, shown I, uh, I have shown before. So uh, uh, from this, I conclude that bulk shaped uh, mount fossils is rather an exception for pelagic red clay. <clears throat> Another special component uh, is uh, non-chained magnet forces. At ODP site uh, 777, we found that uh, for some sample, central reach from the fork diagram has an apparent peak at around 10 millitesla in addition to a more common 30 millitesla peak. Because uh, it is central ridge, 
this should come from non-interacting single domain grains. However, uh, this low coercivity, 10 means Tesla, is almost equal to the theoretical value for isotropic grain, single domain hematite crystal. Crystal elongation or chain formation would significantly increase coercivity. So I think uh, the only explanation is to have isolated grains. Curiously, uh, no difference in crystal morphology uh, of magnetic separates has been observed, uh, even uh, for samples containing a large amount of this peak. Therefore, uh, we conclude that this signature is from an isolated octahedral biogenic magnetite coexisting with chained crystals. In contrast to the uh, bright shaped uh, grains, I think the uh, isolated uh, uh, non chained uh, Mount fossils may be widespread. I have shown these three plots to impress the similarity uh, between uh, the site among the site of the uh, Mount fossil component. However, uh, uh, so when I do uh, component mix and mixing, these could be uh, uh, fitted by a combination of high, higher coercivity uh, biogenic component and a lower coercivity biogenic component, which is very similar to the chained and non-chained uh, component observed in site 777. In contrast to uh, site 777, those sites do not show significant depth variations of the low coercivity part. So uh, data from each site when analyzed individually do not require a mixing of uh, two components. But the results from site 777 hint we may uh, look for uh, the signal in uh, different sites as well. Uh, so uh, this, these are my conclusion. Uh, firstly, to a first order, a magnetism of pelagic clay in the North Pacific can be explained by a rather a simple model of a mixture of three components. And uh, uh, terrigenous components reflect large scale eolian dust evolutions, uh, particularly from uh, around two million years ago. But the data before Otelum MA is still insufficient, and we should uh, do more research about that. The biogenic components may uh, provide deep sea environmental proxy, uh, but uh, generally, uh, the uh, biogenic component is explained by chain octahedral uh, component. So, uh, systematic variation needs uh, further investigation. Um, it is true that the chronology of red clay is rather uh, limited. At the same time, one of the strengths of uh, magnetic measurement is that we can scan a large number of samples compared to, for example, chemical analysis. So I think we have uh, good reasons to uh, continue uh, CIFRA research. And that is a, a strategy, but uh, I also uh, uh, welcome uh, discuss questions and discussion about uh, specific magnetic components in this occasion. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation, Usuishi san. If there is questions from the audience, please type in, in the chat or um, or ask. A big round of applause around. <laughs> thank you very much. I'll, I'll jump in with a question. Uh, thank this you. Is, yeah. uh, great talk. Uh, um, really enjoyed uh, what, what you're showing. How um, I'm not too familiar with the, the sediment ends of things. How, how widespread do you think this um, multi-component mixing uh, is? Mm -hmm. Is it restricted to the North Pacific or do you think this is something we, we're gonna be encountering um, anywhere you look? Um, uh, it's, it's, it's a great question. And the simple answer is I, uh, I'm not sure, but uh, uh, for uh, uh, what I believe is for biogenic magnetite, I think it reflects uh, a living environment for uh, bacteria. And I think it's rather common to uh, uh, deep sea clay 
So you may find similar ones in uh, Atlantic Ocean or uh, somewhere else. For uh, terrigenous components, uh, um, I, I believe these are from uh, mainly um, Central Asia. So uh, it's uh, more uh, restricted to the uh, North Pacific at this age. Thanks, great. Thank you, uh, thank you very much. Um, there is a question in the chat from Gunther. Uh, he said, nice work. And asks if, have you measured a frequency dependent susceptibility on any of your samples? Uh, thank you for the question, but uh, no, uh, I, I haven't. So sorry for that. Thank you. Is, is there any other question? from the live audience? Maybe, maybe there is no other question. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, oh, there is a, there is, yes, please, uh, Shibuya-san, uh, unmute yourself uh, and ask the question. Sorry. Thank you. Uh, um, um, are there any correlation between the uh, remanence, goodness of remanence like that? Hmm. Um, generally speaking, um, sediment with a uh, higher amount of terrigenous uh, magnetite, terrigenous component is, uh, seems to be better in terms of paleomagnetic recording. But uh, I think it's more uh, due to uh, higher sedimentation rate because um, higher, uh, higher uh, uh, terrigenous components suggest uh, increased flux, dust flux, which leads to higher sedimentation rate. So uh, I'm not so sure uh, if um, the remnant's goodness is directly related to the uh, uh, magnetic components. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, if there are there is other question. I have a question, but my my transmission may be complicated. Uh, is what is the red? What is the red color from? What are the the red color of your pelagic clay? Is it hematite or magnemite? Uh, mm. <laughs> I'm, I don't know. Well, first thing is, uh, it's generally called red clay, but the color is not really red. It's probably uh, more like brown or dark brown color. And um, I don't think there is a significant amount of hematite, but of course, uh, color is uh, not quite uh, uh, dependent on the amount. So I'm, don't, I'm not so sure, but I think, uh, for example, dark color uh, is from uh, manganese oxide, partly. And for red color, um, no, well, uh, I don't think I, uh, right now, I can specify uh, the cause. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, you, uh, please remember that you can always post questions also on the YouTube channel if you have any other questions. So if, is there any other question? Um, okay, if there is no other question, we can give another big round of applause to Suitan. Thank you very much. Thank you for presenting to Magnets. Um, uh, we're really, really happy. <laughs> um, if you could please unshare your screen. Um, I'm gonna share my screen. And this is to briefly tell you that we're gonna keep this uh, schedule for the summer or summer in our hemisphere, sorry. Um, from, from June to August. Um, uh, 27th of July, we're gonna have Eric Font from Lisbon. And uh, we have another talk from Zheng Zhang Li, 24th of August. And we're gonna move back to 
uh, kind of Western uh, friendly times from September to December, we are going to uh, need uh, more speakers. So please, if you want to uh, give a talk, please contact me or Greg or anybody from the team. And please also remember that um, all previous magnets, including this one, are available on our, on our uh, YouTube channel. You're welcome to like it and watch them, download them from the earth as well. And thank you again for, uh, for joining us to the Magnet Seminar. Thank you very much.